Hello, gang. I believe that you are all here that's coming. <clears throat> um, my name is Tom Romito. I'm a board member of the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, and I appreciate you joining us tonight <clears throat> to hear a wonderful presentation. But before uh, I introduce the speaker, I want to tell you that the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Oak Harbor, Ohio, which is Northwestern Ohio, if you don't happen to be from that area. Um, we exist to help keep Lake Erie safe and clean by supporting the refuge. And we do that through fundraising and volunteerism. Um, all 14 of us board members have a different interest and we collaborate in many of our committees. Uh, and some of us have our own projects that that are only that one or two people are interested in, but it all works out. Uh, as we go, you're going to see on the uh, in the chat room a link to the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge website, and that is a place where you will see um, announcements of future organizations. You'll, you'll go in there and click on events on the front page. Just scroll down and find events and you'll see the whole calendar for who's coming up in the next few months. Uh, <clears throat> and now I'll tell you that uh, the description that our speaker, um, Bill Chone, is going to talk about is this. He's going to accurately define and understand habitats, help us to understand habitats in detail because they are essential to any birder, naturalist, outdoor enthusiast, or ecologist who wants to get the most out of their experiences in the field. However, understanding and classifying habitats has been a, uh, been a complex and often frustrating undertaking. Several law, lifelong nature guides and itiner itinerant globetrotters decided to take on this challenge and create a system that's accessible in the field for general nature enthusiasts and travelers. And join us as we explore what makes a habitat and how you can use that knowledge to prepare for what you will see anywhere in the highest peaks of the Himalaya to the Amazon basin to right outside your back door. I'd like to welcome Phil Schoen, Phil Chon, excuse, Sean, Phil Sean, excuse me, was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Spent his early years learning as much as possible about the natural world with a lot of help from Cleveland Metro Parks the Clean Museum and Natural History, and the Kirtland Bird Club. And after receiving degrees from, in wildlife bi uh, biology and botany from Cal Poly Humboldt, he spent the next decade as a field assistant, guide, and general bird bum <laughs> on five continents. He has worked as a full-time guide for trip tropical birding for the last five years and currently resides in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'm happy to say that I know Phil personally, because when he was in the Kirtland Bird Club 20 or 25 years ago, he was a teenager and I was a board member and he was uh, noted as what the as one of the up and coming young birders and now he's a real bird geek worldwide. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Phil. Can you hear me, Phil? Yep, I'm here. Sorry about that. No um, problem. You, you, you've got the con, Phil. Take it away. All right. Great. Well, my video is not currently working, but I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so Tom gave a pretty good introduction about what I'll be talking about today. Um, it's going to be mostly based around this book, Habitats of the World, that came out last year. Um, I worked on it with uh, three fellow guides that we kind of pooled our experience. And um, so here's sort of a, a map of the world. And between the, the four of us, this is sort of the, the area that we had covered. And you go out birding. And the main thing when you're looking for birds, I mean, you can check online reports, you can check eBird, but without that sort of resource, um, you're really looking to see what what habitats are like, what 
you know, you, you wouldn't go looking for spruce grouse in swamps in Florida, but um, there's really obvious examples like that, but there's more specific examples as you get uh, to look for more and more specialized birds. And so our thought was that we should find an approach that makes it all um, just a little more easy to understand and a little more accessible to general, general naturalists. So for example, um, this is a tour that we do in Kenya and Kenya is one of the most diverse countries in Africa for birds and that's just because it has this massive assemblage of habitats um, so you're not just driving around in the open savanna on safari you're going through potentially 18 different habitats and that's how you rack up a really good list of birds is looking at these specialized regions where in the the west you have you know aspects of lowland rainforest you have uh Afrotropical heathlands up on the heights of Mount Kenya, you have mangrove forests on the coast, and sort of knowing where these habitats are, what they look like, um, and what sort of wildlife to expect in them is really going to be the key to having a successful trip when you're when you're traveling um, in an unfamiliar area. So historically. Um, Habitats, the way they've been dealt with academically hasn't been terribly useful um, for general wildlife enthusiasts. Um, they tend to either be really broad or overly specific and botanical. And so the definition of habitat is the environment in which a species lives, which is uh, kind of a circular definition that's not really that, it doesn't really give you much of an idea, um, right? You're like, what is, what is the spruce grouse's habitat like? Well, it's like the habitat that the spruce grouse lives in. It's kind of circular. Um, things are also defined in terms of biomes, which are regions of the world that share similar habitats and environments. Uh, but these tend to be super broad. So the deciduous forests um, that you have right outside your own back door are lumped in with the dry deciduous forests in coastal Peru and um, dry deciduous forests in tropical China under this definition. So it's not really, it makes sense in terms of climate and some broader themes between these areas, but they're not really connected um, in terms of what you would expect to see going outside. So the main thing that we decided to take a look at when defining our lists of habitats were one, is it something that you can easily recognize without a degree in botany? Because it's something that has structural differences. Is it tall forest? Is it open? Is there a big shrub layer um, without having to go through and identify whether it's, you know, beech and maple or oak and hickory or uh, specific plant assemblages? And then the second condition is, um, does the habitat have a unique group of animals utilizing it? Um, there are plenty of habitats that look different from each other, but for all intensive purposes, you're going to find kind of the same, the same mix of birds or animals there that you would in adjacent habitats. So here's kind of a look at um, the traditional eight biomes. Um, tends to be tundra, desert, taiga, forest, grasslands. Uh, these are found globally, but again, really differ very, very widely in terms of what they, they encompass. Um, the biomes are mostly, uh, mostly based on climate. So lat latitude and rainfall and temperature tend to kind of dictate uh, definitions of biomes. 
then you take a habitat like this. Um, it's got a bunch of different features. It's got forest. It's got a shrubby understory. You look at these definitions that have been pre-made in terms of biomes or habitats in the broader sense. And if you were in Europe, it's got this drought tolerant understory. It's got winter rain. It's shrubby. In Europe, you'd call it a heathland. But it also has um, cool, wet, deciduous trees. And so it would be a deciduous forest in another part of the world. You've got mixed elements of both um, and nothing to really describe this particular habitat in Australia. So Australia is one of the regions that was really interesting that we had to target because um, it has all these unique kind of plants and uh, the animals within are really closely tied to specific habitats. Um, I'd say that the use of habitat in looking at species assemblages is most useful in uh, tropical areas, just because you have really stable habitats and you don't really have the same, the same movement of animals. Um, migration can really kind of shake things up, but um, in temperate and stable environments, you have animals that are really, really tied to specific habitats and won't necessarily move. So here's a few of the things that we changed from the, the main classical organization of biomes. We split um, dry tropical deciduous forest from temperate deciduous forests. So these are forests that have leaves part of the year and uh, the trees are bare for part of the year. In the temperate zones, like up here, that's based on um, seasons, change in temperature and daylight. And in the tropics, it's based on rainfall, where you have a really distinct wet and dry season, and the trees will lose their leaves uh, in the dry seasons. We split polar deserts from um, arid deserts. Um, the, the polar deserts aren't really you don't really think of deserts being up at the up at the poles, but there are these rocky, barren areas in northern Greenland, um, around Antarctica. Some of the valleys in Antarctica receive less less precipitation than almost anywhere on Earth. Um, some of the absolute driest places on Earth are also completely frozen. Uh, we broke out the Austral Australasian sclerophyll forests. So these are these forests that have these really leathery kind of eucalyptus -y leaves um, that are pretty distinct from either a typical deciduous forest or a conifer forest, something with pine needles. And then the main thing we did was we classified them not just on vegetation, but on the animals that live in them. So if two habitats look similar but have different animals, they're considered two different habitats. And if habitats look different but have very similar animal assemblages, we didn't treat them as two separate places. Um, I would say the one exception to this was anything that was heavily driven by geography. So for example, if you were traveling in the, the Caribbean and you went to Neotropical Cloud Forest on Jamaica and then Neotropical Cloud Forest on Puerto Rico and the Neotropical Cloud Forest uh, on Hispaniola, um, you'd have very different sets of birds in the same habitat, but the reason it's different sets of birds is because they're isolated on islands, not because the habitats themselves have anything specific. So the tropical Pacific has very, very similar habitats over thousands of islands, even though each little set of islands has um, a unique set of birds. And so that was how we chose to handle that. Here's a, a look at the kind of the difference, the um, temperate deciduous forests and the tropical 
wet, dry deciduous forest. So um, these kinds of tropical deciduous forests tend to be pretty thorny and they're found in places like Western Mexico or the tomb base region of like Southwestern Ecuador and Northwestern Peru. Um, they're found in kind of middle elevations in Southeast Asia. Uh, and so by classic definitions of habitat, they're doing the same sort of thing. They're um, leafed out part of the year and they're dry and barren part of the year, but the mechanisms are different and the animals are obviously very different. Um, Phil, I'd like to interject something and you have a nice crowd in the audience and I neglected to say that uh, to the to the audience, if you have questions for Phil, you can enter them into the chat room. I will field them as they come and give them to Sean. He's, he's perfectly okay with that. So feel free to enter something about uh, this discussion of habitat in, in the chat room. Okay, Phil, back to you. All right. So yeah, here's a couple of the kind of different assemblages of um, the temperate deciduous forests. We'd have things like oven birds and cerulean warbler and striped skunk. And the tropical deciduous forests, you'd have things like white-tailed jay in Ecuador or ring-tailed lemurs in Madagascar or golden-rumped elephant shrew in coastal Kenya in the Sokoke forest. So this is obviously why we decided to treat them differently for the book. Uh, we had our, our polar deserts and our arid deserts, again, with very different assemblages of animals. Um, arid deserts are traditionally um, split into cold and hot deserts, uh, which kind of seems, again, counterintuitive. Um, <laughs> Cold deserts have cold winters that generally go below freezing and hot deserts um, tend to stay above freezing. So things like the Sonoran Desert around Tucson is a hot desert and uh, some of the drier areas of the Great Basin or the Mojave or the Chihuahuan Desert um, are all cold deserts because they experience freezes during the winter. The Gobi Desert is a cold desert. Um, And so this is sort of a rough, very rough overview of uh, biomes on a, on a global scale as we defined these broader biomes. Um, it seems to be a pretty, I think people would mostly be pretty familiar with the patterns. You've got your conifer forests up in the north, your temperate deciduous forests in the east, grassland dominated areas in the middle of the country, deserts out west, etc. So I guess we'll just kind of jump right into um, looking at habitats and species assemblages with a familiar example from Ohio. So there's, um, you know, there's not, there's, there's a good variety of habitats in Ohio, but it's an area that has a few kind of more distinct bird communities. Um, and I'd say the most noticeable one are the New Arctic temperate deciduous forests and the New Arctic temperate mixed forest. So the New Arctic temperate deciduous forest are most of the areas of, I'd say Southern and Western Ohio that aren't converted to uh, agriculture or used to be open grassland. Um, these are kind of, they've got a more Southern Southern mix of trees, um, lots of oak and hickory and um, tulip poplar and things like that. Whereas the New Arctic temperate mixed forests are the kind of things that you would see in the unglaciated parts of Eastern Ohio. So if you've ever been to Penitentiary Glen or Holden Arboretum or parts of Mohican, um, Western Pennsylvania has a lot of this. And it's got these more northern kind of beech, maple, hemlock, birch assemblages. And 
again, this is a temperate region, so you've got active migration going on. Um, so I think the best time to really look at these in terms of the different assemblages of wildlife are the, the breeding season, right? Because breeding is heavily tied to specific habitats as opposed to migration where animals are much more generalized on, on migratory routes in terms of uh, what habitats they'll use. Uh, excuse so, me, Phil. Um, yep. A participant, Paul Jasek, asks, or he says, interesting that these two overlap. He may be talking about certain biomes. Uh, can you respond to that, please? Yeah, definitely. There's um, there's a pretty, that's the other thing is a lot of the traditional habitat definitions show everything in discrete blocks, but um, it's nothing in nature's ever that clear cut. So um, there's different factors within a region that can produce two of the two or more of the same habitats. And we'll go into that in more detail a little bit later on. Um, in uh, in Ohio and throughout the Appalachians, um, kind of the topography plays a big role in whether or not you're dealing with uh, temperate deciduous or temperate mixed forest. So I'll go into this example a little more later, but um, temperate, decidu temperate deciduous, you have things like cerulean warbler, yellow-throated vireo, Acadian flycatcher, summer tanager, um, Kentucky warbler, things like that, things you think of as being more Southern. And then you get in those little like hemlocky gorges and things in Northeast Ohio and you'll get juncos breeding and hermit thrush and black-throated green warbler, um, blue-headed vireo, occasionally winter wrens, some of these things you think of as more northerly. Um, and I guess one of the big in that case, one of the big um, driving factors is slope aspect. So um, north or south facing slopes, and we'll we'll circle back to that. So. Um, These, uh, the Yungus and the Cloud Forest are another example of similar habitats with um, really different mixes of animals um, that were traditionally combined as one sort of continuous habitat, but that we've split out as separately um, just because uh, the mechanics are very similar. They're mid elevation. They're defined by really mossy environments with a lot of precipitation and persistent fog or cloud throughout the day. But when you get into it, they've got really different sets of animals that don't really overlap. Um, and once you become more familiar with the habitats, you can start seeing uh, some differences between, between the structure that sort of is driving uh, which animals are there. Another example would be the deciduous temperate forests in uh, Europe and Eastern Asia. Um, again, this is another one where they are, they're pretty similar across the board, but have different assemblages of wildlife. Sometimes shockingly so, you know, uh, the Bailoveza in Poland has Wisent or European bison and a similar habitat in China, um, same latitude, same sort of precipitation and temperature, um, and is hosting things like golden snub-nosed monkey and uh, Reeves pheasants. So it's then there's the other example that we we're talking about: the things that we lump that are typically split out from a strictly botanical. Um, type of um, type of definition. So Australia, you've got in the it's one big we define the orange is what we defined the habitat brigalow as 
um, and the line kind of delineates the separation between acacia woodlands and calitrous woodlands. And so they've got very, very different structures, very separate types of trees, but you go into this habitat and it's the same uh, mix of birds kind of continuously across, which is why we chose to uh, treat this as a single habitat brigalow. Because if you're out there looking for birds, it doesn't really matter as much what the trees look like if they're going to have the same mixes of species throughout. Another um, important aspect of what habitats are where is climate. Um, and something we really tried to produce kind of small, detailed um, maps for the guide of. Um, you know, that also kind of helps you prepare for a trip and know what sort of weather you're going to be getting into, what times of year uh, that you would go somewhere and it would be completely flooded, um, that sort of thing. So at the top, we have these silhouettes that we made that are uh, for every habitat. They're a cross section um, that's just supposed to sort of give you a feel for what moving through that habitat is like, uh, how dense it is, what kind of understory it has, whether there's a lot of layers to the forest and average height of vegetation, uh, you know, lets you know how high up you're gonna be looking for birds, whether you're gonna be dealing with warbler neck, or you're going to be crawling around a bush looking for skulkers, um, that sort of thing. Now, our climate graphs show two things, and these are generally the two things that drive where habitats are, and that's precipitation and temperature. So the temperature throughout the year is represented by a dotted line, and all the solid colored stuff is precipitation um, and it switches between dark blue light blue and orange um, to kind of demonstrate uh, water stress so whether the precipitation and the temperature um, kind of drive how how stressed an area is for water. Um, that affects plant growth, you know, how green something's gonna look uh, and whether the area is kind of actively, actively in need of rainfall. Um, so you can see it's really different across different places. And the if you recognize weather patterns or these sort of climate graphs, um, you could look at one of these and sort of tell what kind of um, habitat would be there. So you've got things like, like rainforest. Rainforest is never gonna be water, water stress. This humid evergreen forest in Iquitos always has plenty of water, um, despite a relatively high temperature. Then you move to a savanna environment in Mali. And again, temperature is pretty consistent, but you've got this really, really strong dry season. And if you think of those African savannas, you've got these periods that are incredibly green and lush and have tall grass and wetlands. And then through a big part of the year, it's dry and brown and there's massive migrations of animals. Um, and these are the kinds of things that you can um, kind of draw from these, these climate maps um, in terms of preparing for a trip or understanding what things are going to be like once you get there. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to visit um, the savanna at the very height of the rainy season. Uh, I'd say like right, right before the rains begin is a good time because um, water tends to be very concentrated and animals are concentrated around water. Um, any of these kind of big seasonally wet tropical savannas and grasslands, uh, everyone goes right before the rains come at the driest time of the year. So like the Pantanal in Brazil is another example, the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Um, you want to visit a time when animals are concentrated. And again, just sort of looking at how these two factors really drive 
habitats. Um, we have a gradient here going from, um, in this case, it's going uh, starting in the north and sort of heading south in Western Africa. So you're starting right up at the the um, Sahara, the southern end of the Sahara, and then you go through these transitions, and um, it sort of gives you an idea of how. So the, in this case, if you look, the temperature is pretty consistent throughout all of these, and the thing that's really driving the difference in habitats is rainfall. Uh, and you see how throughout the tropics, this is sort of how these habitats progress from desert to grassland to kind of thorny, dry savannas to larger, moist, mixed savannas, eventually to kind of open woodland and ending in rainforest. Uh, that's always sort of the, the wettest of tropical environments are always dominated by rainforest. And that, again, has to do with the amount of water stress throughout the year that defines what vegetation can grow there. So if you look at a desert, the precipitation is all orange, which is going to be the plants always could use more water. Um, Senegal, you start getting grasses and thorny shrubs with a little bit of water stability. And as you move along and have shorter dry periods and more um, more periods when there's water available in the soil that can be used for plant growth, you move towards a, a rainforest environment. So I guess the other thing I didn't mention that um, drives what the habitat and the vegetation is gonna look like um, is fire, frequency of fire. So there are wetter areas that have fairly frequent fire. Um, and then there's areas that would are really hot and dry, but don't have much fire. And uh, so you, you have these triangles that'll kind of give you an idea based on climate and fire regime, again, what sort of habitats to expect. So if you go to the wettest, some of the wettest areas of North America and the Pacific Northwest, you have these, these temperate rainforests that have um, very little fire and very little drought. Uh, but then you have areas like, if you go to the sagebrush, the sagebrush areas of um, like the Great Basin, these areas are really hot and dry in the summer and they don't get much precipitation, but they also don't have very frequent fire. Um, and when you suppress fire, so if you start over at the, the steppe prairie pampas area and you remove fire, you're suppressing fire as people have done, um, especially in North America for the last couple hundred years. You have these steps that are fire reliant. You move them away from the fire dominant area and you start getting less of a grassland and more of a shrubland. So in Texas, you have short grass prairies that have become overgrown with mesquite because you've suppressed fire or short grass prairies in Wyoming that have gotten overgrown with sage because you've suppressed fire. And these human activities are again going to drive, um, change, change the balance um, and favor one habitat over another. And again, that's showing how in the same region, you can have two habitats that are in equilibrium and you can also affect the balance of those two habitats that are occurring in the same area. So this is just sort of um, a larger overview of the entire, entire thing um, that sort of takes into account latitude and amount of precipitation and what the the dominant habitat in that area would be. All right, um, desert and semi-desert is going to be rare as you go 
farther north or farther south in latitude because it's going to be not as hot, which means there's going to be less stress on the water table, which is going to allow for um, different types of, of vegetation to uh, to occur there. Here's an example of all of these things working together um, in an area where you've got four really pretty different uh, habitats that you wouldn't think of as occurring together. So you've got mangroves, which are salt tolerant, very dense coastal forests that are tidally flooded. You have these monsoon vine forests that are um, almost rainforest like, but are seasonally dry. Then that's right along the coast. And then you have these big sandstone escarpments. And right at the top, you have spinifex grasslands, which are these open, kind of red, sandy, um, sharp environments. Really, really dry, um, pretty harsh. And beyond that, it transitions into open eucalypt savanna. Um, you know, open grassy forest that's an environment that's a little little wetter than the spinifex desert and these things are all kept in equilibrium and balance in an area that's got a very small area um, by again here's this kind of goes into some more of the factors that um, affect which habitats are occurring where so you have forests occurring in areas that are protected by fire by their proximity to the coast. Whereas when you have frequent fire, you have more grasslands and um, more, more open woodlands. Uh, as you suppress fire, things tend to be overgrown or encroached upon by, by woody plants. Um, there's these really dry winds that happen up on the plateau in the Kimberley that are, are sweeping out uh, moisture and changing. You can't have monsoon forest in an area that's getting hot, dry wind blowing across it every day. Um, and you also can't have monsoon vine forest in an area that's occurring uh, with salt water around it. So you have these mangroves, which are salt tolerant and that area would probably have monsoon vine forest if the salt water wasn't there. For example, if this was on the edge of fresh water, you'd probably have monsoon vine forest all the way uh, right to the edge of the coast. And so this is just one specific example of how all of these different factors are kind of working together to create different habitats and um, show how these habitats can all kind of co-occur in the same area, um, produce different assemblages of birds. Uh, another good one to think about is um, kind of the oak openings region in Northwest Ohio there. Um, that's kind of a mix of oak savanna and even some remnant tall grass prairie. Um, this was a habitat that was pretty widespread uh, throughout Western Ohio, the Western Great Lakes, anywhere with sandy soils. Um, and it's pretty much disappeared due to fire suppression uh, and temperate deciduous forests growing in. But you can recognize that it did have a kind of unique, unique mix of, of birds for the state, at least in terms of naturally occurring environments, uh, things like like lark sparrows and blue-winged warblers commonly and blue grosbeak and um, kind of these typical oak savanna species um, that uh, our restriction of fire have largely eliminated from the state. Now, and this is, um, this is just an example page from the the field guide of how this all works together. So if you, uh, the book is divided into different bioregions, which more or less correspond with major land masses. Um, so Eurasia 
is one and um, Australasia is one. Um, everything from Mexico north is treated under the Nearctic. So if you were going to Wyoming or something, you could open up a page and it would say sagebrush steppe and you would look and you'd get a good idea of the the habitats and um, sort of the structure of the habitat, the distribution, um, a very brief description of what the habitat's like, and then something else globally that's similar. Um, so like these open eucalypt savannas in Australia are pretty similar to the moist mixed savannas in Africa um, in terms of structure. They're similar habitats, but with different species assemblages. You also get the species overlap. So Tetradonta woodland savanna is um, is an adjacent habitat that has some of the similar birds. Um, for an Ohio example, if you looked at those temperate deciduous forest and temperate mixed forest, you know, they would probably, they would be, um, they'd have a good amount of species overlap. So things like Eastern wood peewee and red-eyed vireo would be present throughout. And you'd have to look for indicator species like a black-throated green warbler or a worm-eating warbler to give you an idea of um, which of those habitats was sort of dominant there. If you look at the climate maps here too, these are all habitats that were occurring right next to each other in that um, Kimberley example, but uh, you can see how, how different the climate can be in a, a very, very small area. Um, soil is another factor to, to take into account. Areas with sandy, really well-drained soils um, tend to have characteristics of hotter, drier regions. Um, if you go to the, the oak scrub areas of Florida, um, you know, they're next to really, really hot, humid, swampy areas, but you get in there um, and the soil is really sandy. So all the water just pours right out of it. And it makes the area have a much drier, more Western feel. You've got these small scrubby oaks, you've got cactus. Um, and then you've got things like Florida scrub jay, which while it's its own species is very similar to a bird that might occur in hotter, drier habitats out west. This was um, kind of circling back to what Paul was asking about a little bit um, and whether habitats um, how, they, how they're merging and how they're co-occurring in the same area. We went over sort of why that's happening, but uh, this is a little bit more about how it's happening. So like where to look for habitats or how things are gonna transition. And they tend to either be a mosaic or a melange or ecotone. Um, so these are, an example of a mosaic are two distinct habitats kind of co-occurring in the same area. And again, this can be soil or fire or some other climatic reason that um, is driving this, but it tends to be something pretty, pretty clear cut. So um, distinct transitions in soil or topography lead to distinct um, transitions in habitat. So uh, I guess a good example of the mosaic is the south-facing slope, north-facing slope. Um, you see it a lot more in the west where there's a lot more slopes in general. Um, I can think of New Mexico, for example, if you're at about 8,000 feet, the, uh, the north-facing slopes have a lot of temperate um, spruce fir taiga, so the kind of thing that you'd find three-toed woodpecker, or boreal owl in, and the south facing slopes tend to have this uh, mixed conifer, mixed montane conifer forest that's um, 
dominated by ponderosas and would have, you know, more things like uh, pygmy nuthatch or acorn woodpecker. Um, and some, a lot of the time these things will be, you know, you've got a road going up a stream and on your left, you've got spruce fir taiga and on your right, you've got this mixed montane conifer forest. Um, you do see this a fair amount, not as extreme in north and south facing slopes in Ohio. So I've seen this at Mohican. Um, it's one of the main areas I think of where the park has a really nice mix of both these northern and southern species, depending on which slope you're on. So you've got these north facing slopes that have hemlock and black cherry and sugar maple and therefore have things like black third green warbler or black and white warbler or dark eyed junco. And then you go to the other side, which gets more sun exposure. So in the northern hemisphere, south facing slopes get more sun throughout the year, more direct sun. Um, and that gives them, you know, more heat, less water and tend to have a more you know, arid um, feel. And you get more southern species like yellow throated warbler or worm eating warbler or yellow throated vireo on those south facing slopes. The other and I'd say more common transition is the melange or ecotone. And these are two habitats that kind of gradually climb into each other. Uh, so you don't really see these very distinct lines and it can make them a little confusing. Um, and just sort of understand that these areas, these ecotones will probably have aspects of both habitats that it's transitioning to. So the photo here kind of shows the transition between um, the, the Nearctic taiga, so the boreal forests that you would see in, say, northern Minnesota or all across Canada or southern Alaska, and the, the tundras that you'd see kind of in the, the northern half of Alaska. Um, the middle photo is from the, the council road in Nome, where uh, you can see you've got these some shrubby areas and some really scattered, stunted trees. Um, and you get a mix of both species. You get a patch of denser trees, and you might find Bohemian Waxwing or Canada Jay or Northern Goshawk. And you get into the more open tundra and which um, you get into the more open tundra and you start finding things like American golden plover nesting or willow ptarmigan or um, uh, gray cheek thrush. Um, good thing to, to seek out um, when you're birding because they tend to be productive um, in terms of getting a good mix of species from, from two different habitats, right? You think about the places that you see a big, a big list of birds in the day in Ohio, for example, and you would go to an area that is got, um, some nice deciduous forest, but also, um, freshwater wetlands and open water, right? You go, you go to Ottawa for the day and you get all your forest birds and then you get out into the wetlands and then you might go back into a small patch of forest. And then there's grasslands. I mean, the more habitats you've got in a small area, generally the more, um, more species of birds that you're going to find. So one interesting thing is that um, as habitats shift, sometimes this is looking at um, going from dry open eucalypt forest up to subtropical rainforest uh, in the Lamington National Park in Queensland, Australia. And in, what I was trying to show here is that the species in the canopy 
So the birds that would be up in the canopy are shifting at a different rate um, than the animals that are down on the forest floor. Um, so again, it makes these ecotones kind of unpredictable and interesting. Um, so if you get, if you're starting in the dry eucalypts and you're walking into the rainforest, you'll start seeing rainforest species on the ground before you would start seeing rainforest. So this is another thing to keep in mind when you're out there is that um, while these blend ecotone areas are going to have more species overall, when you're looking for specialized species, it pays to get more into the core of the habitat, right? There's, there's juniper, like pinion juniper forest birds that you might find on the edge of the transition between pinion juniper and short grass prairie, but some of the real specialists like pinion jay or gray vireo, you're only going to find in the core of that main habitat. Um, you might get more species going to an area that's got a mix of both, but the real habitat specialists are going to be in the best examples of that habitat that they're tied to. Uh, here's a little illustration of those um, kind of eucalypt specific birds persisting deeper into the rainforest than the undergrowth species do. Um, this is a mess. I know you look at this, this is really complicated. Um, and it's just here to illustrate how habitats shift over time um, and sort of what causes those habitat shifts. Um, most of these are either due to long-term shifts in climate or nowadays mostly due to human activity. So if you start if you take a big continuous patch of humid rainforest and you clear some of it, the things that grow up on around the edges might be more of a monsoon dry forest. And if you keep clearing it and letting it regrow as you fragment, things slowly move towards desert savanna desertification. Um, this really has happened a lot in the tropical regions, both um, on a long-term historic scale, such as the expansion of the Sahara. Um, you know, a lot of the places that 10,000 years ago were a great place for humans to live have slowly um, shifted from savanna and woodland to desert and in many cases, uh, these, these varnished wastelands. Um, and as you move from these humid forests to deserts, you tend to also lose species diversity. Um, but things can be turned around through habitat management and conservation. Um, got some of these places like Andiapa Bird Lodge in Ecuador, which 20 years ago was a kind of degraded cattle pasture savannah. Um, birds that are more to I mean, Ohio has undergone massive, massive shifts in the past century or so in terms of uh, the majority of the state at some points was completely devoid of forest and was mostly agriculture and grassland. And you had these cases where some animals benefited and other animals really, really did not. So um, like barn owls used to be in 77 out of 88 counties in Ohio in 1910. Um, same with upland sandpipers. There was that, there's a weird expansion of uh, Bachman sparrows that, that happened under 
those conditions where they were breeding in central Ohio through the 40s and 50s. Um, and it's just sort of the either the natural or unnatural swinging of the, the pendulum between between these habitats. Um, these things are kind of in, in constant flux. Um, and you get areas that have remnant patches of habitats that are either disappearing or have been crowded out by restored habitat. Um, Well, Phil, um, we're kind of winding down to the top of the hour, and I wanted to give people the opportunity to yep. chime in with questions. Um, anybody who's got a question, you don't have to put it in the chat room. All you have to do is unmute yourself or press your space bar on your computer and speak, and uh, Phil will hear you. Who would like to be the... Oh, I see. Dave Rodriguez says, what does varnished mean here? Bill, could you feel that one, please? Yeah. Um, it's generally an area that has lost soil, soil stability, and it's, it's pretty rare to see. It's in these really, really degraded, um, drier areas of the tropics where there's been a lot of water leaching and wind, and you've got these just kind of hard dirt packed areas where plants can no longer grow and they've got a uh, almost a layer of of minerals on top um, so kind of mm -hmm. salt salt flats and uh, um phil uh, paul asks are strip mine areas like in southeast ohio varnished no no because you look at these strip mine areas and a lot of them have um really good quality uh prairies and grasslands in them. And so clearing the forest like that and allowing it to regenerate has um, kind of mimicked what used to be a natural process um, through fire, right? There are all these, the Eastern forests, the Piedmont prairies in Virginia and the coastal areas um, it used to be naturally maintained through fire and you'd have all these pockets of prairie and grassland that as we've suppressed fire, have grown up um, and these strip mines are the same sort of thing where they will if you leave them alone they'll go through this natural progression where they'll start off as really nice grassland for five or ten years and then shrubs will move in and you'll get things like indigo buntings and chats and that sort of thing and then that'll grow up into younger forest and eventually the grasslands will be will be gone um, unless they're maintained. So that's why it's really important for areas in Ohio that are looking to keep keep grassland birds around. You have to keep have to keep burning it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of bring this closer to home uh, to Northwest Ohio, where the Ottawa National Wildlife is. It is uh, such a um, have, has many diverse habitats in a very small, well, 10,700 acres. We have wetlands, we have grasslands, and we have forests. So within that complex of 10,700 acres, if you wanted to see songbirds like um, the Eastern Phoebe, you could go to the South Woods. If you want to see um, Wilson's phalarope, you could go into the wetlands of the dikes. And then if you wanted to see uh, a peewee could go out into the forest of the the, of the north woods so it's it's kind of all there exactly you know even within like the it. wetlands there's uh some of that variation where if you wanted to see yellow-headed blackbird or least bittern you would go to the like the really dense cattail reed bed areas of the marsh and if you wanted to see you know uh blue-winged teal or um great egrets, you would move to some of the more open wetland areas. And so even within a habitat, there's some pretty cool well, variation. And I'd like to point out to our listening audience, if, if you're not in Ohio, the, uh, the Ottawa County, where the refuge exists, is the place to go if you want to see a lot of bald eagles. Because Ottawa County has uh, um, 92 active bald eagle nests there, which is more than any other county in Ohio, and it's largely because 
of the uh, pr preservation of these wetlands on, on the north coast of Ohio. And that's what the, the, uh, the refuge exists to do is to preserve these wetlands from the uh, fertilizers that are coming off the farmlands that would otherwise go right into Lake Erie, destroying the wetlands and, um, and destroying our, our drinking water. So um, with that, um, I'm going to say to people who are uh, listening that um, you're going to get a re uh, an email of this recording <clears throat> of the presentation. And when you see the when you see the email, you'll see the opportunity to complete a survey about this program and how you liked it and what you'd like to see on a program. So please do that. So Phil, we'd like like to, uh, on behalf of everyone, I thank you for, for presenting to us. Uh, does anybody have anything uh, for the good of the order before we close the meeting? Uh, Paula Lozano, whom, whom you may remember, Phil says, thanks Phil for this interesting presentation. Thanks for showing up everybody. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm sure it was everybody's pleasure. So I, I bid all of you good night and um, be well. Bye now.